you have your Bibles, would you open with me to Luke chapter 10? Luke chapter 10, that's where our lesson will come from today. And uh, just one uh, one little observation. Well, we had some technical problems this morning, you might have noticed. Can you see this better than the last time, the screen? Well, we're gonna try to make it higher on there. I know it's, it's not quite where we want it, but we're gonna try to get it there. Um, last week, some people uh, made, uh, I'm not sure if people were complaining or they were kind of excited about it, uh, but if you were here last week, you might have noticed that if I was standing on that side of the screen, when I was over there, if you were sitting on, was it uh, this side of the auditorium or the room here, you couldn't see me, just my silhouette. And if you're on the other side, you could see me and both sides complained. Uh, I, I don't know what to make of that. Uh, I, I've always had a face for radio, I think. Um, Anyway, all kidding aside, we're working out the bugs. It's just going to take us a little time to figure everything out. Uh, I want to begin, uh, we started talking about simplicity last week and complexities of life. And we're trying to, uh, to think for a few weeks about how it is that Jesus and the gospel makes life uh, simpler, right? Not as complex. Uh, I want to begin with a, a joke. This is a joke by a guy named, guy named Emo Phillips. Anybody know that comedian, that comedian's name? I don't know anything more about him really than he wrote this joke. Uh, that is listed as the greatest religious joke of all time, okay? It wins everything. Um, if you don't like it, then that has a lot to say about how bad religious jokes are, okay? But if you do like it, you might laugh a little bit. Uh, it's a complicated joke, pay attention. He says, once I saw this guy on a bridge about to jump, I said, don't do it. Uh, he said, nobody loves me. I said, God loves you, do you believe in God? He says, yes. Uh, I said, are you a Christian or a Jew? He said, a Christian. I said, me too, Protestant or Catholic. He said, Protestant. I said, me too. What franchise? He said, Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern Region. He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. I said, die heretic and I pushed him over the bridge. Um, it's a complicated joke, right? I mean, I, I, I actually spent some time trying to memorize that, but I'm just not that good, right? Uh, so I, I couldn't figure that out, uh, how to do that. But I, I think it's a funny joke, but it's a complex joke, right? You gotta kind of follow the whole thing, and at the end, the punchline is kind of simple. You get it, right? Some things can be very complex, and yet very easy to understand. Make sense to you? Well. I think there's something else to be said, uh, and kind of the opposite thing. I mean, some things are simple to understand, but very hard to do, right? Some things are simple to understand, but very hard to do. Uh, and just because something is simple doesn't mean that it will be easy. Uh, if you spend some time paying attention to Jesus as he teaches, you'll find uh, that Jesus said some things that were very, very simple to understand, but very, very hard to put into practice. Uh, some of those things as examples today, for example, in Mark chapter 8, uh, Jesus is talking with his disciples, and uh, as he's talking with them, he wants to know something. He says, who do people say that I am? Right? Remember that conversation that he has? Who do people say that I am? And Jesus, uh, the disciples say, well, uh, some say that uh, you're like Elijah, uh, or, uh, or like one of the prophets, right? And Jesus listens to that, and he says, okay, but who do you say that I am? I mean, when you look at me and you see what I do, who do you say that I am? And remember, Peter speaks up, and he says that you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, right? Uh, well, after that conversation, Jesus goes on uh, to, to, to tell them that if you want to follow me, you have to do something very specific, right? Do you remember what he said to do? If you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. It's so easy that without even looking into your Bibles, if you've read it before and thought about it even for a few minutes, you remember that what Jesus wants you to do is to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him, right? Because Jesus knew that the biggest obstacle to you following him is going to be you, right? So you got to get you out of the way. Is that simple to understand? It's pretty simple. Is that easy to do? There's a difference between simple and easy. Because Jesus says some things that are incredibly difficult to do and incredibly easy to understand. 
Uh, Jesus also said one time uh, to his disciples, or to actually a large crowd of people, in uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44, when he's doing the Sermon uh, from the Mount, and on the Sermon he's saying all these things that are very simple to understand things, like you can hear Jesus and put them right into practice. But he says something in that Sermon that really grabbed everyone's attention. He says, you've heard it said before that you should uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, right? What does Jesus say? He says, but I say to you that you should love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, right? Well, is that easy to understand? Simple to understand? Absolutely. But is that easy to do? Absolutely not. That's very, very difficult. In fact, some of the most difficult things that you'll ever do in your life is to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. Now, would Jesus ask you to do something that he himself isn't willing to do? Absolutely not. Jesus also uh, loved his enemies. And even when the, he was being crucified on a cross by those enemies, what did he do? He prayed for those who persecuted. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Uh, Jesus is very capable of asking us to do things uh, that are simple to understand, but very difficult to put into practice in our lives. Another example comes in Luke, I think it's Luke chapter 18. Uh, Jesus is approached by this young man who is kind of the poster boy for uh, pious religiousness. Does that make sense to you? Pious, he was like super pious. He was very religious. Uh, he comes to Jesus and he says, you know, Jesus, I've done everything that I'm supposed to do. According to the law, I've done everything that the law requires me to do. What more do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Remember what Jesus said to him. It's not complicated. He says, okay, you, here's what you need to do. Take everything you have, right? And he was a very wealthy young man. Take everything you own, and what are you supposed to do with it? Sell it, and then set it aside in a trust so that later on in life you can use it to your retirement. Is that what he said? That's not what he said. He said, take everything you own, sell it, give it to the poor, and then follow me. Well, why would he tell him to do such a thing? It's simple to understand, isn't it? But it's very, very difficult to do because you're very wealthy. And that young man takes and he turns away and he goes away sad. Why? Because he was a very wealthy person. And what Jesus knew about him was that that, that person was going to be held back from following Jesus so long as his commitment to the things of this world, the material possessions, his financial, uh, his financial security was in the way. He had to get rid of all of those things, right? Is Jesus capable of asking us to do things that are very simple to understand, but very difficult to put into practice? Absolutely. In fact, we can just do a series of lessons, one lesson after another after another, on all the things that Jesus said to do, right? How about the one where he says, unless you hate your father and mother, right? Remember that one? Unless you put away your family as secondary to the kingdom of God, right? Uh, how about this one? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given unto you. Simple to understand very difficult to put into practice. And so when we're talking about simplicity, I'm not talking about going the easy way. Like there's no magic wand that we just wave over our Christian life that automatically makes us go, oh, this is gonna be so easy, right? It's gonna be very difficult. There's a reason why it's a narrow road, right? There's a reason why uh, it's difficult to follow Jesus, but it's not difficult to understand what he's asking us to do and what he's demanding of us. Uh, and that brings us to our lesson today, which is in Luke chapter 10. Give you a little bit of context in Luke chapter 10. Uh, at the beginning, Jesus takes his disciples, who he's been traveling with for some time, and he's been teaching them. He's been doing miracles. He's been doing incredible things. They're impressed by everything he's doing. They're getting an idea of who he really is. And he says, now it's time, right? And he says to the 70, right? He says, I want you now to go. I'm going to send you ahead of me to go into these cities. And here's how simple his instructions are. Take nothing with you, right? Uh, do you ever go on a long trip somewhere? Uh, and you don't know how long you're going to be gone, what do you take with you? Everything, right? You take everything. Well, some of you are like, we're going on a short trip. What are we take with us? Everything. Why? Because you never know, right? Because you never know. You might need that one thing. Uh, well, so, so they're told, don't bring anything. Don't bring any money. Don't bring any food. Just go, right? Sandals on your feet, clothes on your back. Go. No many belts, nothing, right? Uh, and then, by the way, they're think, what would you be thinking? Where are we going to stay? Right? We're, what are we going to eat? If we're not bringing anything with us, how does, how's that going to work? So Jesus says, wherever you go, when you go in there, you go into a person's home, and if a person of peace is there, right? if the person welcomes you, then what do you do? Well, you stay. You hang out there, and you eat at their table, whatever they put before you, and you, you stay with them for as long as it seems reasonable. Um, and, then, and then what if you get to a house and someone is not reasonable, and they don't welcome you, right? What if they reject you? Jesus says, well, then 
leave. Go away. Wipe off the dust that's on your feet and keep on trucking, right? Go to the next house. Find a place of peace. Share the good news, the gospel, uh, with the people. And then as long as it's peaceful, stay. When it gets to the point that they reject you, then leave. Does that sound pretty simple to you? Did you notice that simple also requires faith? Because right? they didn't have all the answers to the questions at the beginning of this. So this is what happens. They go out and they do this. And it's very successful. In fact, Jesus observes as they get back together with him, because he'd said earlier on in the chapter that the harvest is plentiful, right? But the workers are few. So send out these workers. And so he sends out the workers. And they come back. And, and he takes a look at them. And he, and he says, I, he has this vision, right? And it's this vision of the sky. And he says, I saw Satan falling from the sky, right? Uh, and, and, and he has this, this vision, and what he's saying is that, that what you've done, right, was, was successful. You, you're victorious. The message of the good news is now going out to people. The harvest is now being uh, taken and brought in. And Satan has, he saw him falling from the sky. And, and so he's saying that this was a successful mission that they went on. Uh, and then a little bit later in that same chapter, he goes on to point out that God, as he speaks to God, he prays and he says, you didn't reveal these, these things to the wise and to the intelligent. He says, instead, you chose to reveal these things to who? Do you remember? He says, to infants, right? Not to the wise and intelligent, but to the infants. The same word that's translated infant is also translated a simple person, right? Instead of the wise and intelligent, just to the simple people of the world, they were able to hear the message of Jesus, the Messiah has come, they were able to receive that message, and what a blessing it is that even though the wise and intelligent, if you read your Gospels, it's pretty obvious, wise and intelligent tend to miss Jesus. It's the simple people, uh, the blue-collar workers, if you will, the people that are highly educated, the people who uh, are, are sinners among sinners. Sinners, the people who are kind of the, the lowest of the low, those are the ones who see Jesus for who he is. And they want to be near him and they want to follow him. They hear that message. And so this, this chapter is full of these, these wonderful things. But, but he's trying to say, look, this is not for those who think that they're better than everybody else. This is a message that can be heard by those who simply receive and see Jesus for who he is. Now, all that being said, it takes us to this point where as he's going along and he's teaching, uh, he uh, he has this encounter with a uh, fallen apart still. Let me try to stay together here. Uh, he has this conversation with a lawyer, right? Uh, and so in verse 25 it says, And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, right? So a lawyer, is he simple or is he the highly intelligent, right? This is the, the assumption is that this is the wise and intelligent. And so he's going to put Jesus to the test. And he says, he says to him, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? Right? So he puts the question right back to this guy. And he says, Well, what do you think the law says? You're a lawyer, you know what the law says. And he answered, he said, You shall love, you guys know this passage, the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Okay. Now, what do we call this? These are the, this is the greatest command, right? This is, this is the top command, that you are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and your strength. Like everything you've got, you're to invest into loving God. And the second one, Jesus says in one of the other Gospels, is like it, you are to love your neighbor, how? Well, as yourself. Top things in following Jesus are so simple, right? Number one thing, love God. What's the second? love people, right? Well, this lawyer doesn't find Jesus' uh, response to that satisfying because Jesus says at the end of this, he says, he says, well, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Okay? Do this and you will live. If you love God and you love people, then you will live. And I think that he's implying here a spiritual life, that you'll have a spiritual health and, and, and vibrance that goes on into eternity. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself. Okay, so uh, there's a, what we call a yeah, but. Is that, you know what I'm saying? You ever tell your kid to do something like, hey, go clean your room? Uh, yeah, but, you know, they don't want to do it, right? They're trying to get out of it. They're going to give you an excuse. Or maybe you thought to yourself this morning, you know, it was hot the last two Sundays. It's a little bit less hot today. We're working on it. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Maybe, yeah, I, I know I should go to church. Yeah, but uh, the people that listen to this on video that stayed home for that reason, mm, I'm speaking to you. No. Uh, but, you know, you're like, hey, I know I should study my Bible. Yeah, but, or I know I should, you know, I'm saying we have all these things and God isn't going to accept any of these 
yeah, buts, right? These are just these excuses that we give to God as to why we're not going to do what God has simply told us to do. And this guy says, well, I'm going to give you a yeah, but wishing to justify himself. What does he do? He asks a question and he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor, right? Now, how am I supposed to understand a very simple thing like who was my neighbor? So Jesus, he doesn't lambast the guy. Instead, what he does is he gives him a story. He says, let me tell you a story. Uh, now, this is an interesting setup. Talking to a group of Jews, okay? You understand that? He's talking to Jewish people. Uh, and Jewish people were rather biased against uh, Gentiles, right? But they were super biased against Samaritans. And that's an important part of this story. So he begins and he says, in verse, uh, this is in verse 30. Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Sounds reasonable. It happens all the time. And he fell among robbers. He was by himself. He was exposed. And uh, they attacked him. It says they stripped him and uh, they beat him and they went away, leaving him half dead. We all know the story, right? This is the guy. He's down in the ditch. Uh, he's been beaten. He's been stripped of his clothes. He's been hurt. And it says, verse 31, and by chance a priest was going down that road, going down on that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Okay. Now, do you think that that priest, as he was passing by, had a yeah, but? You know what I'm saying? Do you think that maybe as he was going by, he was kind of like, you know, I should probably have, yeah, but I've got this, I've got this thing. I got to go to church, right? Uh, I'm a priest, and I got to go to church. Man, if I touch this guy and he's dead, I'm going to be defiled, and then I won't be able to lead worship. And you know, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to mess that up. So yeah, I'm going to keep on trucking. So he keeps on going, right? And then it says, likewise, also a Levite. And the Levites, by the way, from, from the tribe of Aaron, they were the worship leaders of Israel, right? They were the ones that offered sacrifice. They were the worship leaders of Israel. And it says, when he came to the place, they saw him pass by on the other side. You think he had a yeah, but? Yeah, I think he did. Yeah, but you know, I, I know I should help him. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've got these sacrifices to make today, and if I don't make the sacrifices, then people won't be reminded of their sins. And if they're reminded of their sins, then people could lose their, I mean, whatever. This guy says, I'm, not, I'm just going to keep on going. So he keeps on going. Now, this is where it comes in handy to know that they despise the Samaritans. And uh, Jesus was uh, known to be a person to instigate problems when it came to their biases against Samaritans and Gentiles. And so Jesus says this, but a Samaritan, no yeah buts here, is but a Samaritan who was on a journey came to him and when he saw him he felt compassion, right? He felt mercy for him, right? He saw this guy that was beaten and naked and robbed and half dead down in an inch and he says, I, I, I need to help this guy. And so instead of walking by or saying, I'm on a journey, I got things to do, uh, I'm a Samaritan, what do I care about this guy anyway, right? He just takes off and goes down to the ditch and he helps him. And it says when he saw him, he felt compassion, he felt mercy. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds, um, pouring oil and wine on them. He put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii, that's two days wage, and he gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will, when I return, I will repay you. In other words, I'm not done with this. I'm just washing my hands of this and walking away. He's saying, I'm gonna leave with your resources and then if you need more resources when I get back, I will shore that up. I'm gonna take care of this here. I'm gonna do the right thing and help this guy out. Take care of him, whatever more you need, I'll return to you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? Now, don't read the next verse. It's pretty, pretty simple, right? It's a simple question. It's a simple story. Which one proved to be a neighbor, guys? What do you think? The Samaritan. Now, we all know that, right? But so did the lawyer, right? He knew that. It was such a simple observation. Uh, the guy was asking a question to try to justify himself and to test Jesus. And when he wasn't getting anywhere with that, he tried to make it more complex. He tried to make it complicated. Yeah, then, yeah, but who is my neighbor really, right? In this case, he goes on to say, the one who showed mercy, the one who showed compassion toward him. Then Jesus said, go and do the same. Do you think he got the point? Like if the smallest of us in this room here can listen to this story and go, yeah, I get the point here. It's a simple story. Is it hard to do though? I mean, it's pretty, I mean, okay, let's talk about that for a second. Uh, when we talk about loving God, is that pretty easy? I, th I think maybe for most of us, I can say, yeah, it's kind of easy for us, right? Uh, if you believe in God, if you believe that the Bible is God's word, if you believe that he has offered his salvation through Jesus and you've received that, and you know that God is gracious and kind and compassionate and merciful, it's pretty easy for you to love God, 
right? It's pretty easy for me to do. Now, is it always easy for me to show that love? Uh, do I sometimes feel really guilty because I act against God's will? Absolutely. But the loving God for me has not really been the most difficult thing I've ever had to do in my life, okay? However, loving others has a different set of challenges, doesn't it? Don't look at each other. Um, well, isn't it true? I mean, is it true that people are sometimes difficult to love? I mean, that's a true thing. Uh, and I think that we can say, yeah, I mean, uh, I want to love people more. I need to love people the way that God loves people. And then I see someone down in the ditch and I go, yeah, but, but is it really my neighbor? Right? Do I really have to love this person? They, they don't have the same. What, what if I get down there and, and I help them and they're there to rob me? What, what if I could be put at risk? Or what if I don't have enough resources to really help this person? Or what if they don't have the same political views that I have? Or what if they have a different religious perspective than I have? What if I help them all the way through this and I find out that they don't even know what gender they are, right? What if I do them and all these things and I find out they don't have the same the same mindset about, about family and culture that I have? What if I help them and they turn out to not be like me? You know what, most people that are having a mess in their life may not be like you. In fact, I'd say most of the time, they're probably not like you, right? Loving God's pretty easy, but loving people can be very, very difficult. But does that change the equation? Is it not simple enough for us to understand that God requires of us that we love Him with the utmost, and that we love our neighbor as ourselves? Is that simple to understand? But not easy to practice. Um, and yet, Jesus still demands that of us. He still calls us to that. Um, I think that when we talk about complexity, let's talk about this for a second. In our culture, our culture has taught us that we have to be uh, very conditional in the way that we love people. Right? And I know that people will say to you, "Oh no, just free love, right? Just free everybody, love everybody. It's all good. Coexist. You got the stickers and thing like that." But when you start digging in, you start talking to people, start talking to people about. Uh, what they actually believe and what they actually practice, they have to make choices all the time about who they're actually going to love. It's very, very conditional. We talked about all those worldviews last week. It's it's what's in it for me, or do you line up with my worldview, or, or or do you have the same orientation that I have, or do you have the same heritage or history that I have? All of these are questions that our world is constantly asking, and it's very complicated because it's always changing. Remember last week I said that if you let the world tell you how to live or and today's case, how to love, it's very, very complex. Because I'm always having to decide who am I going to love and who am I going to reject based on what her culture tells me lately about who to love and who to reject. Does that make sense to you? Gospel makes this very easy. Jesus makes this very, very simple for us to understand. Who are we supposed to love, church? Everyone. Jesus makes it so simple that I don't have to make decisions about who I'm going to love anymore. I can just love everybody. Why can I do that? Because Jesus did that. Because God does that. Because God is love. I can just choose to go the way of Jesus and love everybody. Doesn't that set you free? Isn't that less complicated than saying, I'm not sure if I should love these people or those people for whatever reason and all the different criteria that you come up with. Just to say that the gospel sets you free to simply love people the way that God loves people. We live in a culture that wants to challenge that. If we live in a culture that wants us to constantly be reevaluating who are we going to love, do they align up with everything that I that I believe? And if they don't, then I have to reject them. That is not how Jesus did it. Jesus tells a story about a man who went down into a ditch and got into a really messy situation with no idea about who this person was or where they had been or what they had done in the past or why they were in the ditch in the first place. All he knew is that that person needed compassion and he proved that day to be a neighbor to that person. Um, the gospel teaches us to love everyone everywhere. You no longer have to choose who you're going to love. Uh, now, why is this an important lesson for us? I, I keep asking that question every week right now. Why is this an important lesson for us? Uh, I think for a few reasons, but at least one of them is that we live in a generation uh, that has made life very complex. If we go back a few generations, and I don't even know who's old enough to be in that generation here today, uh, but if you go back to the greatest generation, okay, uh, you know I'm talking about late 20s, early 30s, uh, we call them the greatest generation, they're followed by the builder generation, uh, after World War II there was a rebuilding of things, they're followed by the boomer generation, which was the if you build it they will come, very high organization, lots of wealth, lots of money, uh, and by the way the rise of Christianity in the United States went 
went through the roof during the boomer generation. That's a, that's a very real thing. Uh, but they built places, they built institutions, they established political um, uh, structures. This was the, the, the builder generation or the boomer generation. Now, we've had a couple generations since, and we don't really understand fully yet. One's the millennials, okay? Uh, and don't, don't get into too much. They're a little hard to understand, but what they've done is they've looked at previous generations and said, we don't want to do that. We don't want to build new stuff. In fact, we don't want to participate in the stuff that's already built. We kind of want to be left alone. Okay? They're the same group of people that have to be taught how to have a conversation with other people. Did you know that the murder rate is down among millennials? Because they don't like to be in the same room with each other. I mean, I mean how do you murder someone if you're not in the same place at the same time? They'd rather be on the phone. You know, I mean, that's, that's what happens. But that generation has given way to a number of newer generations. Those generations have become what we might call, and what often are called now, deconstruction generations. Okay, you understand what I mean by that? We got to tear down structures. Um, some of us, if we bought a new piece of property, if we bought a field, and there was a fence in the middle of that field, what would we do? Uh, well, some of us would go out there and go, hmm, I wonder why this fence is here. I should think that through. Not this generation. This generation goes, tear down the fence. Get it out of there. Why? Man. I don't know why. I don't know why it's there in the first place. We'll figure it out later. Just tear it down. The problem with a deconstructionist culture, which is what we live in today, uh, the problem is that the, 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 the proceeds of that culture will be chaos. Okay? You tear down the family, you tear down marriage, you tear down gender, you tear down all of the things that give, give substance and structure to life, and people will end up in chaos. And when people end up in chaos, churches need to be built on a firm foundation. We need to be the kind of people who say, wow, they made a gigantic mess. You know what we should do? We should be a neighbor. No more yeah buts. We should go down to the ditch and help them where they're at because they're going to create for themselves chaos. They're going to create for themselves a mess. Can anybody relate to what I'm saying at all in our culture today? I just need you to nod your heads just a little bit with me and let me see that you understand. Uh, the reason this is an important lesson is because we don't live in a simple culture anymore. We live in a very complex culture, and it's getting more complicated uh, day after day after day. And it's not going to end anytime soon. But what's going to happen is, at some point, people are going to hit a place, and the chaos is going to be too much, and they're going to start asking questions like, hmm, I think I need more than this. I think I need some structure to my life. I think we've, we've destroyed everything, but now what? And they're going to come to that point. Uh, I was talking to a young lady here probably closer to a year, year and a half ago, and um, she was referred to me by someone else, and we were talking, and she was raised to not believe in God. That was her, her family taught her, literally, do not, you can believe anything you want to believe, just don't believe in God. That was their, her family. Uh, and she was explaining to me that she'd gone through some difficult things in life, and there were some messy things going on in her life, and she said these words to me. She said, I feel like I need to have faith, but I don't know why. I don't know where to look. Does that make you see why maybe we need to be people who offer a simple message? Right? Jesus Christ crucified, a gospel message of a death and a burial and a resurrection, a good news message that there is a solid rock upon which we can build a life and build a life that leads into eternity and that isn't just destroyed by all of the deconstruction that happens in our, our culture today. I think it's an important thing for us to think about in terms of simplicity that the church has an opportunity to offer people a place of structure and safety and permanence in a world that is tearing away all of those things from them as fast as they possibly can. Um, in, uh, in a sense, what I'm uh, going to start using as, as some language here is I think that we need to be incarnational influencers. Does anyone know what an influencer is? Uh, okay, if you do, you've spent too much time on TikTok, okay? So yeah. raise your hands. Uh, but an influencer, they, they hire people to go out and be an influencer for a brand of something, right? They have, they, they want to sell you something, so they wear it or they, they chew on it. I don't know what they do. They do stuff, right? You know, and they, this is the product. And you're the influencer. We need to be incarnational influencers. You know what I mean by that? It's very simple. Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the incarnation. Right? Now Jesus enters into our lives and we become Jesus to the world through our flesh. That's what inc incarnational influencers are. And as you go through this life, as you go through these months ahead of us, as long as the Lord will allow, you can influence the world around you with the simple message of Jesus and the simple practice of loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. It's pretty good. 
Holy Father, we thank you for this gathering today. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for redeeming us. We thank you, Father, for the simple message that you have that you have revealed to us through your word and by your Holy Spirit. Father, we ask that you would help us to, to clearly embrace the things that you have simply revealed for us in the scriptures, that you would be with us as we go through the process of the difficulty of living those things out. Father, we ask that you would help us to love our enemies, to pray for them. Father, we ask that you would be with us as we put ourselves away and we take up our cross and we follow after you. That we would take all the obstacles in this life, whether it be our money or our possessions, that we put those things away and that we pursue you, Father, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We love our neighbors, ourselves. Help us, Father, to be, uh, be a light to this world, to be salt to this, in this world, to be Jesus to the people around us. Father, please bless us to be faithful. Go with us now. In Jesus' name we pray.